All right, since we have two speakers, I'm going to break my rule and start at 8 o'clock instead of 8.01. So welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming in on a super cold day. I hope you all enjoy the super um, blood wolf moon. Um, last week it was fantastic and beautiful. And today uh, our Grand Rounds is very exciting, and Dr. Krines is going to give us a history on this. But this is our Science Now Day, which began several years ago as a way to highlight and excite people about uh, the fantastic research that we do here in the department. Vince, do you want to just give a little history of Science Now? Sure, I think you did a pretty good job. To, but, but basically the premise for this is to get uh, particularly our trainees, trainees of all ages, um, to let you know about some of the amazing research going on here in the department. Uh, honestly, our two speakers today, you could not find two better research mentors, uh, Cindy Carlson and Don Davis. And I'd say, you know, there's this kind of, uh, when I talk to uh, uh, residents and some of our fellows, they kind of view the research world and clinical worlds as completely different. What um, kind of the theme today, I mean, we have Alzheimer's and hypoglycemia, the theme really is, that both of our speakers are outstanding clinicians and their time at the bedside, you know, brings up questions that they study in the lab and then they bring it back into the clinic. So that's all I'll say. Um, Betsy will give a, a more eloquent introduction of our speakers. So thanks, Vince. And I think that many of you might remember when Dr. Page came, I think this is one of the big things that uh, changed was our grand rounds and some of the exciting things we do here. And Dr. Kreins, thank you for your work on this for the past few years. So our title today and our two speakers, uh, Dr. Uh, Cindy Carlson is going to be talking about the future of diagnosing and treating dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. And Dr. Dawn Davis is going to be talking about from the bedside to the bench and back again post-bariatric hypoglycemic etiology and treatment. So a little bit about Dr. Carlson. So Dr. Carlson is one of our tenured professors. She is an associate professor. Uh, she lives in the Division of Geriatrics. She holds many leadership positions. I'm going to just highlight a few here. She's the co-director of the VA Memory Assessment Clinic. She is the co-core leader of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, which is ADRC. Many of us know of it in that name. She holds two professorships. She is University of Wisconsin Vilas Distinguished Achievement Professor. She also holds the Lewis A. Holland Senior Endowed Professorship in Alzheimer's Disease through the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. I think that's really quite an incredible um, honor to have two professorships. She also is the Associate Director for the Wisconsin uh, Alzheimer's Institute. She did her medical degree at uh, University of Michigan Medical School. She did her internship, her residency, and chief residency here at University of Wisconsin. And that was followed by a fellowship in geriatric medicine and a fellowship in older women's health. She also holds a master's degree in population health sciences. She's had many uh, achievements and honors, and I just want to uh, just highlight that she uh, recently has been the chair of the NIA Review Committee for the Beeson Career Development Awards in Aging, which is uh, fantastic. Dr. Davis, a little bit about her before we get started as well. So she did a, a, med a med medical scientist tr training program followed by her PhD in the Department of Pathology at University of Chicago. She then went on and did her medical degree at University of Chicago as well. Her internal medicine residency was at University of Washington, and she followed that with her fellowship in endocrine diabetes and metabolism here at University of Wisconsin. She also is one of our tenured professors uh, who is an associate professor. She uh, lives in the division of endocrine diabetes and metabolism. She also holds several leadership positions. She is the director of research for the endocrine division uh, at UW-Madison, as well as the co-director of the integrated program in endocrinology here. And she is a section chief in endocrinology at the VA. Uh, her most recent award, which I think is fantastic, is in 2015. She uh, received the Pusto Research Award from the Department of Medicine for a junior faculty member who's made the most significant research contribution to medicine. So, you know, I, suffice it to say, these uh, physicians are incredibly fantastic scientists. They are great clinicians, and, and I do agree with Vince that this is an example of scientists who um, talk directly to us as clinicians. So with that,
Thank you all. Thank you for coming out on this cold, beautiful winter day. And thank you, Dr. Trowbridge and Dr. Kreins, for those kind introductions. Uh, again, what we'll try to do today is to show you a snapshot of the different types of research being done right here at UW-Madison. And I'm always so thankful to be able to talk with, um, with you all and really thankful to be a part of this department. This department's been amazingly supportive of the research that I've done personally and that our program has done um, as a whole. And so um, it's, it's great to be involved with research that really works directly with our patients. So I'll be talking today about the future of diagnosing and treating Alzheimer's disease. Um, and again with this, what I'd like to do is just to give a snapshot of where we are now with our diagnosis and treatment, um, where we may be going with future research, and how UW-Madison and our team here is playing a role in that. I received grant support from NIH, the VA, um, several companies, and also several philanthropic organizations. So what we'll start with today is to talk about early identification of Alzheimer's disease, and then talk about emerging treatment and prevention strategies for Alzheimer's. And again, with UW-Madison being a school of medicine and public health, what we also care about is making sure that our treatments are getting out into the communities, into diverse communities. So we'll talk about some of the initiatives we're doing on improving quality of dementia diagnosis and care management in diverse communities. So I think a lot of us are familiar and know that the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease is increasing in the U.S. and worldwide. A lot of this is driven by the fact that um, people are aging successfully, and so with that aging, they also have an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that these numbers are projected to increase dramatically in the coming years. But despite this, only about 50% of patients who have dementia are diagnosed currently. And so that raises questions, why is that? In developed countries where we know what dementia is, why are we not diagnosing dementia more often? And so part of that, it's probably numerous factors, but part of it may be um, that patients don't recognize that they have dementia. They may think that it's just normal aging. Um, clinicians don't recognize someone has dementia. They may think it's part of normal aging too. We don't have much time in our primary care appointments to spend the time or the tools really to diagnose it effectively. We don't have good diagnostic tests for Alzheimer's disease. And so all these factors together um, play into why patients are probably underdiagnosed. The other thing is, too, though, sometimes, honestly, as clinicians, we may think, why bother? Is there much to do about it anyway? Do we have any good treatment or prevention options? So why would we even bother to um, diagnose it? But if any of us prescribe medicines in the room, I think there's probably a few of us who prescribe medications, we want our patients to remember to take their medications, right? We want them to follow their care plan. We want them to remember to do their preventive care. So again, a lot of these things are directly tied to us recognizing and supporting people with cognitive changes. So when we think about how we currently diagnose and um, treat patients with mild cognitive impairment and dementia, again, what this is is when we go to clinic and we're diagnosing someone, we're focusing chiefly on what we see in the patients. And when we, um, those of you who work with me in our memory clinic here know that, again, the diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment and dementia are fairly clinically oriented. So if somebody has some cognitive impairment, it's showing up on some cognitive testing, but they're still able to compensate, um, get their work done, you know, show up on time for their appointments for grand rounds. Um, again, what that means is they have something called mild cognitive impairment. But once it progresses where somebody's functionally impaired, they, um, you know, again, their cognitive changes affect their ability to show up for work, to be able to do their daily activities, that's when we say that someone's progressed to a dementia. So again, these are the most recent diagnostic criteria from 2011, but again, you can see they're very, very clinically oriented. Again, mild cognitive impairment is based on, again, that symptom, cognitive impairment. Once they lose their ability to compensate, that's when we call it a dementia. So again, that doesn't really get at what we're seeing here, um, these accumulating, I guess, that right. Anyway, the accumulating brain changes on the bottom there. So again, dementia can be caused, and mild cognitive impairment can be caused by a lot of different factors. So again, we're really limited in our clinical practice because we can identify the cognitive changes, but not necessarily what those underlying causes are. 
And we know there are a lot of causes of, of mild cognitive impairment and dementia. So some of us think of Alzheimer's and dementia as the same thing. Alzheimer's is really the pathology that's driving the clinical picture we see in our patients. So um, Alzheimer's disease is by far the most common cause of dementia, but commonly we'll see mixed dementias, Alzheimer's in Lewy body or Alzheimer's in vascular, um, and there's some other dementia um, pathologies that are less common. So one new framework that we as clinicians should start becoming familiar with is this framework called the ATN criteria. And unfortunately, I don't think the neurologists who developed this um, talked to the nephrologist who already had ATN as acute tubular necrosis, so you'll just have to bear, bear with it. Um, so again, what this ATN criteria are, they're trying to really characterize what are the key pathologic factors that drive Alzheimer's disease pathology. So the A is for beta amyloid, which is the chief component protein made up in the amyloid plaques. The T is the tau, or phosphorylated tau, that's found in the neuronal cells. And then N is the neurodegeneration. So what the, the just published last year, um, Cliff Jack and colleagues um, published these criteria so we can start categorizing not only what we see in our patients by the clinical criteria, but what we're seeing in the, in the brain changes in these patients. And so these ATN criteria, you'll see in articles published, and they may become in clinical practice in the future. So we can actually start measuring some of these ATN um, components. So for the um, neurodegeneration, we can use structural MRI to look for atrophy in the neurodegeneration. So again, you can see on this coronal section of a patient with Alzheimer's disease that they have generalized atrophy throughout their brain. And also in the area that's blown up down below, they also have um, hippocampal atrophy in that area. So the, air, the shrunken um, feature that looks like a little peanut there is the hippocampus that has shrunken over time as this person's progressed with Alzheimer's disease. We also have some other novel measures that are not yet part of the ATN criteria, but um, cerebral blood flow measures that, we can, that have been developed here that look at blood flow in the brain via MRI are some of the other novel ones that are being used here. So again, N can be measured by the um, neurodegeneration markers. Also, um, novel tracers for PET scans can also tell us more about the ATN. So currently, we have FDG PET, um, which can tell us about glucose metabolism in the brain. So if we have neuronal dysfunction in parts of the brain, we do an um, FDG PET scan, we can see that there's hypometabolism, decreased metabolism in those components of the brain. And that can help us in clinical practice even to differentiate Alzheimer's from frontotemporal dementia. So that's a tool that's, that can be used in a clinical setting. But now in the in recent decade, we've been able to develop um, um, we meaning the royal we, not me, but the colleagues at, um, at Pittsburgh have developed tools that will be able to help us see amyloid directly in the brains using PET imaging. So again, what, what shows up in a PET scan depends on what tracer is injected. So for these scans, uh, you inject a, there's a variety of amyloid tracers. The most common one is Pittsburgh compound B um, that can be injected. And then it lights up where this amyloid is um, and shown here, so again, the amyloid plaques, you can see them with the areas that are more red having more amyloid. Um, and then the other thing that's been developed is a tau tracer. So a tau tracer, a separate scan that can identify some of the tau changes in people who have risk for Alzheimer's disease. Now this picture here is provided by my colleague Sterling Johnson. And again, this is in a person who's 70 who does not have any cognitive problems. So again, these are changes that are occurring before they develop cognitive symptoms. So again, does this person have Alzheimer's disease? They have Alzheimer's brain changes, but they don't have the clinical symptoms yet. So again, this is where it start, we start questioning how are we going to make these, um, how are we going to use these tools in our clinical practice? Are we going to tell our patients they have Alzheimer's if they have these A, T, and N, or are we going to wait till they have clinical symptoms? So these are some of the things that we as clinicians will have to work through as our science progresses. So again, A, T, and N being able to be measured by PET. And then other, my favorite, uh, CSF biomarkers. So cerebral spinal fluid biomarkers can measure amyloid, tau, um, and some other markers of neurodegeneration, synaptic function, et cetera. So again, we have some tools that are being developed. Of these, really, MRI is used to rule out other things, so stroke. And then FDG PET can be used in a clinical setting. These tools are available in research settings, but otherwise not yet in clinical practice. But we'll talk about that some more. So where are we now with our current treatment? So right now, the um, 
Treatments we have for Alzheimer's disease uh, include the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, so denepazil, ribostigmine, um, galantamine, and then NMDA antagonists, um, chiefly memantine or nemenda. So those are the only medications we have for treating Alzheimer's disease. Again, they really focus on the symptoms because they're treating kind of the end, the terminal damage to, uh, caused by neurodegeneration of the nerve cells. So they're not really disease modifying at all. They're really just targeting the end, at the end damage to the nerve cells. And so we have not had any new medications for Alzheimer's disease for 15 years. This is awful. So that's why when we, when we beg and plead for you to engage your patients, encourage them to be a part of Alzheimer's prevention research, it's not just so we can get our studies filled. It's because as clinicians, we, we want to get more therapies. We need more therapies to be able to treat our patients effectively, something that's going to really modify their course. So if we think about what our drug targets are now, on the left-hand side, if you see the amyloid plaques, the right-hand side, the neurofibrillary tangles, and then the synaptic dysfunction in the middle, this schematic kind of shows you some of the base, basic mechanisms we know that go behind that. So some of the enzymatic changes that lead to amyloid, um, beta amyloid production, aggregation, deposition. And then on the right-hand side, some of the changes that lead to tau hyperphosphorylation within the cells, how they aggregate. But really, when you think about our treatments, all we're doing right now is the tip of the iceberg, basically, by focusing on synaptic dysfunction. So this is another area that here at UW we are trying to work on. How can we look at modifying beta amyloid um, deposition? How can we also look at other targets? Are there things outside of the scheme that contribute to Alzheimer's pathology that aren't really directly related to amyloid and tau? So here at UW, we have two programs that work closely, synergistically, in a complementary way to try to address Alzheimer's disease research and care. So we have the um, Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute and the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And these programs, WAI was started in 1998 by Dr. Mark Sager and really has supported dementia service, outreach, education, and research and has been the home of um, the Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention, which is a longitudinal study started by Dr. Sager and now led by Dr. Sterling Johnson. The Milwaukee Regional Office, led by, Dr. Or by Ms. Gina Green-Harris, was started in 2008 and really focuses on reaching out to diverse communities in the Milwaukee area and now throughout the state as well. WA also supports 36 um, affiliated clinics where we do training in trying to implement quality dementia care throughout the state and really hopefully partnering with them to improve our research presence and to be able to get these good therapies out into diverse communities throughout the state. So not just keeping it in Madison, that whole Wisconsin idea about getting things out to the rural providers, the urban providers, the persons in um, tribal communities, African American, Latino communities, etc. Wisconsin ADRC was initially funded by the NIH in 2009. We are one of 30 NIH-funded Alzheimer's disease research centers. Um, the Wisconsin ADRC is led by Dr. Sanjay Asana. Um, he really was spearheading the, the effort for this and has grown and become one of the uh, leading centers in the U.S. We've been really thankful to have this. Um, again, it's one of 30 centers, so not only do we collect data locally, but that data is shared with these 30 centers so we can have a bigger impact on dementia research. In our study just here at UW, we have over 900 research participants, and we collect clinical data, um, um, samples, blood samples, spinal fluid samples, neuroimaging. And again, these samples are all available for you all who are interested in research. So these cohorts that are, that are evaluated for both of these centers, so again, the RAP study has been going on since 2001. Um, it has over 1,500 participants in this study. Um, it's, it's continuing to recruit people from underrepresented backgrounds. They get um, cognitive testing every other year, a computerized battery. They have lots of questionnaires to be able to assess their lifestyle factors, risk factors. Um, also get some um, cutting-edge neuroimaging studies to look at some of these biomarkers that we've talked about. And then also cerebral spinal fluid in a subset as well. Wisconsin ADRC also has a cohort, again, this 900, over 900 participants who are a mix of cognitively healthy, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia. So again, you have this big range of participants 
who are available to um, be able to study some of the changes over time, what are the factors that go into causing Alzheimer's, what are some protect protective factors, and then the Alzheimer's Center participants can go into clinical trials to see what are ways we can modify their risk for Alzheimer's. So again, we've been really thankful. It's a great partnership with um, patients throughout the state um, who have really helped us advance our knowledge of Alzheimer's disease. This is just a snapshot and a plug for our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center resources. So for those of you who are interested in doing research, um, have a project idea, want to look at some data, um, there's, there's thousands of samples from this. Um, if you go to our website and look at this new web page, we have these different services. So genotyping services, data collection, will help you set up your neuropsych cognitive battery, we'll even do CSF collection for you. Um, neuroimaging services help set up an image, imaging protocol if you need help. Um, biomarker and assay services, statistical support, and again, there's stored samples, blood, CSF, DNA. So again, I encourage you to look at this and think about how maybe your, your research could overlap with this. Or if you're interested in doing a project, thinking about something that ties in with these resources. And then additionally, with our Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute, we have this clinic network that was launched in 2000. Um, currently, we have 36 clinics throughout the state of Wisconsin. They come down to Madison twice a year and get detailed training on how to provide optimal care for um, their patients in rural areas like Spooner, Wisconsin, um, you know, up in Rhinelander, et cetera. So again, these patients, we also have clinics in um, Latino uh, clinic, a Spanish-speaking clinic. We have an African-American clinic in Milwaukee area um, and are also working with Dr. Carrie Gleason to try to start up one in Oneida Nation on the reservation. So again, these resources um, can serve as a way to get the word out about the good research being done and also as a resource to try to let people know about research throughout the state and encourage them to participate so that we can have good representative research um, results. So um, as far as early identification of Alzheimer's disease, again, there's a lot of different biomarkers that we've been able to use. So one of those is cerebral spinal fluid. So um, again, CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid, can measure the A and the T, so the amyloid and tau. And from our team's work, we've been able to use these thousands of samples that have been collected over time to evaluate several things. So one, that these plasma and CSF measures of neuroinflammation and synaptic function um, are related to beta amyloid and tau, that these things are related to changes in brain microstructure on MRI. We also have found that these CSF biomarkers are related to things we care about as clinicians in the cognitive decline and cognitive impairment. The other thing these CSF biomarkers has helped us with is to be able to link these with some of the vascular risk factors and other factors that increase our risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. And so we've found in our studies that these biomarkers are related to CSF lipids like ceramides, sphingomyelin. Um, they're related to insulin resistance, poor sleep, um, cardiorespiratory fitness, physical activity, and Dr. Barb Benland is doing some really unique work looking at the gut microbiome and how those are related to cerebral spinal fluid biomarkers of Alzheimer's and risk for decline. Oh, I'm going to go back because the reason I, I started putting up the references and the reason I decided to leave that big chunk of references up there for all this work is that what that represents is a huge team um, team effect. So again, working with a lot of investigators across a lot of different disciplines and also a lot of trainees. So in these publications, they're led by, by undergrads, by med students, by fellows, by postdocs. There's a lot of trainees involved in these publications. So it's a really fun group to work with and I've, I've learned a lot by working with people across these disciplines. So I just wanted to put that up there because I think that really represents the great teamwork that's, um, that we have here at EW. So here's another representative publication led by Dr. Lindsay Clark here with our team. And what this shows is that people who um, are cognitively healthy but have some of these Alzheimer's disease biomarkers, so again, amyloid positive are those who have elevated amyloid um, or have abnormal levels of amyloid, tau positive have abnormal levels of tau, and in the combination, you can see that chiefly those who have abnormal amyloid levels in their spinal fluid are the ones that lead to having more cognitive decline. So you can see the, the people who have amyloid are in the yellow and then the green. You can see that they follow some pretty similar trajectories. Those that have just tau don't have as many changes. So again, what we're trying to do is to be able to identify who are the people at greatest risk for cognitive decline, and these spinal fluid tests can help us do that. 
I also mentioned some of the unique um, neuroimaging um, studies that are being done here. One area is developed by our wonderful medical physics team um, here at UW. Um, Dr. Oliver Vieben has developed this um, MRI scan that's called a 4D flow or PC Viper MRI. And you can see on the schematic drawing here these little blue planes that cut through the vessels in the brain. And so what they can do is to get a three-dimensional view of the flow through the brain and also a four-dimensional flow by getting a time component as well. So you can see the nice pictures that go here. And, and through this tools, we found that people who have lower cerebral blood flow and more stiff vessels um, are associated with metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, and also brain um, pathology. We've also found using different novel MRI and PET scans um, that these findings, these abnormal findings are related to memory complaints, genetic risk profiles, physical activity, occupational complexity, and cognitive activities. So again, what this points out is that these biomarkers are showing us a person's risk for decline, what risk factors we should be targeting, and therefore will give us a tool to be able to follow if we modify those risk factors, if we get someone exercising or address their insulin resistance, can we try to reduce their risk for Alzheimer's disease. So what about using these in clinical practice? So this study is one um, that's looking at what about using amyloid PET scans in clinical practice. Wouldn't that be nice if we could use that, have our patient come in if we're not sure if they have Alzheimer's or not, we could um, have them come in and get a PET scan and then go from there with their treatment and plan. So the IDEA study is one that's sponsored by CMS. And what it does is it, has, it uses amyloid PET when there's a decision. If someone has mild cognitive impairment or an atypical Alzheimer's presentation, it allows clinicians to do an amyloid PET scan and then use those results to see if it's going to change their practice. So for a lot of us, before we get a test, we run, we're, we're trained to think, is this going to change my management for my patient? If not, then why should I do it? And so that's basically what this study is doing. Um, it's aiming to look at um, amyloid PET on the management of patients using appropriate use criteria, but also what are the rates of hospitalizations and emergency room use related to um, having this information. So this study um, was done in about 16,000 people, and it, early results are coming out supporting that it does change behavior and, and practice behavior, but again, the final results are still pending. So this is exciting that moving some of these research tools out into clinical practice. So what about emerging treatment and prevention strategies for Alzheimer's? So again, using these novel research tools, we've also been able to find out who are the people we should have in some of our studies. So the A4 study is the anti-amyloid treatment in asymptomatic Alzheimer's. This is co-funded by Lilly and NIH. NIH is the lead on this. It's in over 1,100 people throughout the world. UW-Madison is a site, and I serve as the site PI for that. We've been working on this study for about four years or so. It's, it's cognitively healthy adults who um, are at risk for Alzheimer's because they have amyloid in their brains. They have an amyloid scan. It shows they've increased amyloid, and then they are at risk for dementia. We don't know, um, you know, not everyone does go on to get dementia, but they're at risk because of their amyloid depositions. They have to come in and get an IV infusion every four weeks. We have people driving from all over the place who come down to Madison every four weeks for these IV infusions. And the primary endpoint is looking at cognitive change over time. So again, this is one of these studies where we're actually trying to look at disease-modifying therapy, and we're using some of these new novel biomarkers to be able to identify, make sure we're getting the right people into these clinical trials. So those results, it'll finish up the first participant later this year. Um, there'll be an, uh, um, probably be a few years till these study results are out. In the meantime, while we're waiting for disease-modifying therapies, we're also building on this data that vascular risk factors and brain blood flow may have an effect on Alzheimer's. So we're doing a variety of studies where we're looking at factors that we know probably influence brain vascular health. So we've done several statin studies, finding some results that support that there could be some improvement in cognitive function and brain blood flow to parts of the brain that are really important to memory and learning. Another study that we're working on currently um, is the BRAVE study. So this is a study in brain amyloid, and, uh, I can't remember what I called it, brain <laughs> amyloid and vascular effects. And this is using a cosapentethyl, which is a um, prescription EPA fish oil uh, tablet, uh, or tablets, uh, capsules. Um, and so what this is looking at is trying to see, can this high-dose um, fish oil improve brain blood flow? 
can it change amyloid levels in the spinal fluid and change cognitive function in veterans? So veterans have a higher risk of developing dementia than the general public, likely because of the, consolation, the concentration of vascular risk factors, depression, and head injury in the past. So we've been really thankful to work with our VA colleagues here on this study, um, still recruiting for this study. So if you know of patients who are VA-eligible veterans um, who are cognitively healthy but at risk for Alzheimer's, again, we're trying to think about ways we can look at other mechanisms besides disease-modifying therapies while we're waiting for them. Another study is the EXERT study. So this is another national study being done, led by our colleague, Dr. Um, Ozio Makankwo. Um, this is based out of um, Wake Forest, so Laura Baker is the main PI on this. It's an 18-month clinical trial looking at can we improve exercise in people with mild cognitive impairment. And again, just like we talked about, we see that the, the exercise is related to those biomarkers. Can we look at exercise then as a tool to see if it can change brain health in these patients. What about if we combine these things? So if we combine exercise, diet, and some of these other interventions that we try to encourage our patients to do anyway, and here is a study called the FINGER study. There's also um, it's a Finnish geriatric study, so I guess it's really FINGER, Finger, Finnish geriatric study, um, to prevent cognitive impairment. And they, they tried a multi-factor approach. So they integrated diet, exercise, cognitive training, vascular management, and they did find an improvement in vascular perf in cognitive performance. So again, there's lots of data that while we're waiting for the di disease-modifying therapies, probably addressing these vascular risks can help too. So now let's talk a little bit about how are we going to get these good therapies out into communities. So again, we really want to try to reach and use these networks that we have developed to really make sure that we get the best quality care out into very diverse communities throughout the state. So what we're doing now is we've been evaluating quality dementia measures, so are we controlling blood pressure well? Are we, do, are we doing these vascular risk factors? Are we um, encouraging patients to exercise? We're trying to assess some of these dementia quality measures. We're also on the verge of being ready to send to use blood-based biomarkers for amyloid to see if they could possibly be used, kind of like the IDEA study, to help change our clinical practice. So those are some other things we've been thinking about. We also want to make sure that racial and ethnic diverse patients are part of our clinical trials because we want to make sure that these are generalizable and then getting these back to these diverse communities throughout our state. And then lastly, encouraging uh, adaptations of novel model practices, treatment methods throughout our clinic. So again, we're really hoping that this network will develop into a pragmatic clinical trial resource for people. So again, encourage your patients to get involved in Alzheimer's research, um, check out our resources. There's a variety of education and research, re research resources available on our websites. And so in summary, um, again, we have really new novel technology that in C, um, imaging technology and CSF assays that could increase, that can help identify who's at risk for Alzheimer's disease. And blood-based biomarkers are improving and starting to enter clinical, or starting to enter clinical studies. Biomarkers are being increasingly used to clinical, in clinical trials to help tailor a therapy. And then really novel pharmacologic and lifestyle interventions are being done right here at UW. So hopefully you heard some things that maybe sparked your interest in doing some research. We have a huge, wonderful team. My lab is awesome, and we have great colleagues at WAI, ADRC. I couldn't even list everyone on here, and wonderful participants throughout the state and the country. Um, so I'd like to thank you, and welcome Dr. Davis to the platform. Okay, I think we decided we're going to do all the questions at the end, so um, keep, um, keep in mind what you wanted to talk to Cindy about, and I will just get my slides up here. talk about is somewhat similar, but also in many ways completely different um, in, in terms of the disease process and kind of the approach that I took to establishing this, this research project. So we're going to talk about a rare disease, uh, post-bariatric hypoglycemia, which was newly characterized around the time I started being interested in it. And um, there's literally was no research or resources really available. So as opposed to the all the great wealth of um, resources and studies and biomarkers available in Alzheimer's, this was kind of starting from scratch. Um, 
So what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is uh, the objectives would be, to, first of all, to explain to you what this disease is. So what is this complication of hypoglycemia after gastric bypass surgery? Um, hopefully at the end you'll understand a little bit about postprandial hormone regulation of metabolism. And then finally, um, my goal is really to help you understand how to recognize a clinical challenge in your clinical practice and then translate that into a research opportunity to help um, your patients. So we're going to start at the bedside. Um, this is a clinical mystery or the clinical challenge that, um, that faced me in clinic. This was a 47-year-old woman who first came to see me in 2008. Um, she had a history of RUNY gastric bypass surgery. I'm going to use that RYGB uh, abbreviation throughout the talk. Um, she had lost 120 pounds in the first year after surgery, so her surgery had been very successful. But when I saw her about a year and a half later, um, she was complaining of symptoms that uh, she described as sweatiness, shakiness, tunnel vision that happened um, usually during the daytime hours, uh, didn't seem to happen in the middle of the night or when she first woke up. And they were happening pretty frequently, almost every other day. Um, and her symptoms did seem to improve if she ate something. So if she had some candy, then her symptoms got better within about 15 minutes. So this certainly sounded a lot like hypoglycemia, that she was having these kind of classic um, sympathetic response to hypoglycemia, and um, her symptoms improved with uh, food intake. For those of you who have ever worked in my clinics or in endocrine clinics, you may have heard of Whipple's triad. What we talk about with Whipple's triad to diagnose hypoglycemia is that you have to have a documented low blood glucose, and it has to be associated with classic symptoms like sweats, shakiness, um, things like that, and then the symptoms have to improve with food. So she essentially um, ultimately met that criteria for Whipple's triad to diagnose her with hypoglycemia. She had no history of pre-existing diabetes prior to her gastric bypass surgery, and certainly not after. Um, so at that initial visit, we gave her a glucometer, sent her home, and said, like, check your blood sugars during these episodes. And when she came back, she had blood glucose readings as low as 36 during these symptomatic episodes. But interestingly, she also had some high readings on her meter, like in the 300. So it was a little confusing. Why is she having low blood sugars and high blood sugars? What's really going on with this patient? So we got some baseline lab work, um, started with just fasting labs. So her fasting glucose was perfectly normal at 88. Um, her fasting insulin was also normal, maybe a little bit on the high side, but in the normal range. Um, her hemoglobin A1C, if anything, was a little on the higher side at 5.7, kind of getting in that prediabetes range. Um, and, she, and we kind of did the other workup that we always think about for hypoglycemia. Are her kidneys working? Is her liver working? Does she have hypo, hyperthyroidism? Does she have adrenal insufficiency? All of that was normal. So we really didn't have a clear etiology for her hypoglycemic episodes. So then um, because her symptoms really were happening after she ate, um, we thought, well, let's see if we can trigger a hypoglycemic event by giving her some thing, some food or some glucose and see if that's what happens. And so we did a relatively standard 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test that we normally would use to diagnose someone with diabetes. And in her case, what happened is, I don't know if the pointer's working, but um, what you can see is she starts with a basically normal glucose when she's fasting. It does go up a little bit about an hour later and then drops precipitously um, to a value of 44 um, at about two hours after the glucose was taken in. Um, we also measured her insulin during this time because one of the things you're always thinking about with hypoglycemia is this insulin-mediated hypoglycemia. In other words, is she making an excessive amount of insulin that's driving her blood glucose low? And what hopefully you can appreciate here is that, yes, she's making a whole lot of insulin when she first ingests that glucose, but by the time she has the hypoglycemic event two hours later, her insulin levels have dropped dramatically. So it's not like she has a continuous overproduction of insulin. She's just making too much in response to her glucose intake. We went on further to um, set her up with a continuous glucose monitor that she could wear at home. And um, hopefully what you can appreciate here, each of these little blue dots is essentially a glucose reading. Uh, these continuous glucose monitors can capture a glucose reading every five minutes from the subcutaneous fluid. And, you know, if you, if you or I wear one of these, our glucose is going to, like, maybe wiggle around a tiny bit, but it's not going to go like this. <laughs> so what I hope you can appreciate here is her blood sugar is going up and down and up and down and up and down all day long. 
So every time she eats something, basically her glucose spikes and then it drops rapidly and then it spikes when she tries to correct that hypoglycemic event and then it drops again. And she has several severe episodes of hypoglycemia below 60 um, during this one day. Um, and then again, she wore this for several days and, and we confirmed that she was having multiple episodes all the time. So what, what does she have? So what she essentially was ultimately diagnosed with is post-bariatric surgery hypoglycemia. At the time I saw this patient in 2008, this was basically a very new diagnosis or a new um, syndrome that was just being recognized. But over the intervening years, we have sort of defined criteria for this syndrome. And, and what we know about it now is that it typically presents about six months to a year after someone has gastric bypass surgery. Interestingly, it is not seen in other bariatric surgeries typically, like gastric banding or sleeve gastrectomy. It seems to be relatively specific for gastric bypass. The hypoglycemia in these patients is postprandial, so they um, develop these low blood sugars, just like our patient, about an hour and a half to two hours after they eat, and the hypoglycemia is really triggered or much worse in the setting of high carbohydrate intake. So when they eat more carbs, they have more hypoglycemia which is a little counterintuitive, right? Most of the time we tell people with hypoglycemia to eat more carbs to keep their blood sugar up. In this case, it causes them to have a low uh, a couple hours later. And the hypoglycemia in this case, um, again, they usually have no preoperative history of diabetes or hypoglycemia. This all pre pre uh, presents itself right after their gastric bypass surgery. It is associated with these high postprandial insulin levels that I showed you, but ne again, not necessarily associated with high insulin at the time of their hypoglycemic event. And finally, again, they have no fasting hypoglycemia, so they are perfectly fine if they're not eating. They don't drop low in the overnight hours or when they're fasting for a procedure or something. It's only after they eat. So again, this uh, was pretty newly described phenomenon. It was first reported in a New England Journal um, case series in 2005, um, which came out of the Mayo Clinic. In that study, what, what was um, proposed was that this uh, disease process was probably due to something called nocidioblastosis, which is an overgrowth of the pancreatic beta cells that produce insulin, um, not necessarily in the form of a, a specific tumor, but just an overgrowth of each in an individual islet. So this is a pathology slide from that paper where they proposed that compared to obese controls, <clears throat> that patients who had this uh, phenomenon of hypoglycemia had increased uh, islet mass, and therefore they thought that was the etiology. So in this initial case series, they actually had gone ahead and um, treated some of these patients with partial pancreatectomy, essentially removing part of their pancreas, which is the standard treatment for nystioblastosis, to try to prevent their further hypoglycemic events. However, about a year and a half later, another paper came out actually looking at the same exact tissue samples from the hypoglycemic patients, but now comparing them to different control populations and analyzing the slides a little bit differently. And they, in fact, refuted this initial study and said, we don't actually see any difference in overall beta cell area or insulin-producing um, insulin tissue in the pancreas. So there's a lot of controversy around this time. Is this a, something that we should be treating with partial pancreatectomy? Or is this something that we need to um, identify a different etiology? And certainly, um, partial pancreatectomy is a very morbid procedure. You don't want to send a patient for that if it's not going to be, <coughs> excuse me, helpful. So uh, the next thing that came out essentially was what is really driving this phenomenon? And um, people have already known for quite a long time that patients with gastric bypass surgery have altered postprandial hormones. So when they eat, their hormone levels are quite different than they are in a, in a non-gastric bypass patient. This is specifically, we're gonna talk about GLP-1 today. Um, in the interest of time, I can't go through all the hormonal changes, so we're gonna stick with one um, hormone. So GLP-1 in gastric bypass patients, you can see is the big line going way up there. So GLP-1 spikes really high in a gastric bypass patient, and then again drops within about an hour to two hours after the meal. And this is much different than someone who's had gastric binding or a standard um, control overweight patient. <clears throat> so what is GLP-1? Again, most of you may have heard of this. It's a peptide hormone that we think about a lot. It's secreted from the gut, um, the neuroendocrine cells in the gut in response to food intake in normal people. And again, enhanced uh, secretion in patients with gastric bypass. 
And the reason we're interested in it for this um, particular uh, phenomenon is that there's been studies, particularly in mouse models, that show that GLP-1 may stimulate new beta cell formation, may stimulate insulin secretion, and therefore, if you have a whole lot of GLP-1 coming out, perhaps that's what's driving this whole phenomenon of excess insulin production and hypoglycemia. So some of the possible mechanisms for this phenomenon had been uh, proposed over the years, and as you can see, there's, there's many possibilities, accelerated gastric emptying, this enhanced GLP-1 secretion, other adaptations in the gut that change the way the glucose is, is absorbed, or um, maybe change the way that GLP-1 producing cells are, are present in the gut. And then, as I mentioned before, disordered pancreatic pathology, in other words, disordered islet um, size or function that's unique to the pancreas itself. Um, other proposals have included altered bile acid composition, gut flora, and liver metabolism and insulin clearance. So there was a lot of ideas out there, but really no one was clear on what was really leading to this disorder. So what I basically, I just wanted to walk you through in this slide a little bit of my thought process. So, you know, my lab has been focused over the years on pancreatic beta cell biology. We're interested in trying to get beta cells to grow and, and preserve beta cell mass in patients with diabetes. So I was really interested in mechanisms of beta cell growth. One of the potential mechanisms of beta cell growth was GLP-1, so it's something we were looking at in the lab. And then um, we also, again, have interest in identifying new factors that could promote beta cell growth and maybe something about a gastric bypass patient, it, they're producing some factor that might be driving beta cell growth. So this, the lab scientist in me was really interested in this clinical phenomenon as a potential way to inform the research we were doing in the lab. And on the clinical side, I was um, helping take care of these patients who were really struggling with this daily symptoms of hypoglycemia over and over again. There was minimal literature about treatment options, and um, the other concern really was that gastric bypass surgery is something that's incredibly effective for weight loss and diabetes um, prevention and cure. And I really wanted to be able to promote that to my patients, but now I have this severe side effect that is kind of worrying me, and I want to more understand more about how to predict who's going to get that side effect, what's causing that side effect, and maybe treatments we could develop for it. So back into our patient. Um, so she, unfortunately, continued to progress, having significantly worsening symptoms. She developed hypoglycemic unawareness, so she didn't really feel her low blood sugars anymore which led to her getting into a car accident due to a hypoglycemic event. We had tried several interventions that had been proposed in the literature and just kind of the, uh, what we thought might work for her. Again, there was not much to guide us, <laughs> so we used a low-carb diet. We used a carbose, which is a medication that blocks carbohydrate absorption from the gut, hoping that that would limit her carb absorption and therefore limit her hypoglycemia. And we tried verapamil, which is a calcium channel blocker that also works at the level of the beta cell to in slightly inhibit insulin secretion. In the meantime, I had several more patients in my clinic who had the same phenomenon, and we had tried all of these same things. Many of these patients did, again, have more severe symptoms, progressing to seizures, car accidents, loss of consciousness. So it was a big clinical challenge. And again, there was no FDA-approved therapies and no clinical trials published to really help guide therapy. <clears throat> So um, I mentioned that partial pancreatectomy story. So this was um, the Mayo Clinic where they were doing these partial pancreatectomies. They did four, this on 48 patients with this post-bariatric hypoglycemia. And then unfortunately, about five years later, they published this follow-up study which essentially said it doesn't work. <laughs> so 87% of these patients had recurrent symptoms um, and 25% had absolutely no benefit in terms of hypoglycemia uh, frequency. Okay, so now getting to what we did. Um, so <clears throat> my hypothesis had been that this could be due to the pancreas or it could be due to altered absorption of food in the gut and altered production of gut hormones. So I partnered up with Guillermo Campos, who is one of our bariatric surgeons here. He's since moved to Virginia Commonwealth University, but he was a great um, partner for this study. And, you know, we kind of had similar ideas about this. We sat down and talked about what we thought could be causing this problem, and we came up with a hypothesis, which was that altered, um, again, these altered postprandial hormones 
were probably a function of how the nutrients were going into the system and really didn't reflect altered pancreatic islet biology per se. So our idea here was, again, when the food comes in through the gastric bypass, through that red arrow, it comes straight in through the esophagus. There's really no stomach at all. There's no pylorus, and it just dumps straight into the jejunum. Um, that leads to rapid absorption of glucose, high levels of GLP-1, which could increase early insulin and lead to more hypoglycemia. Our idea was if we instead had these patients fed through the more normal route of their stomach, pylorus, duodenum, that they would have less postprandial glucose excursions and therefore less GLP-1 and then also hopefully less hypoglycemia. So the first step was to identify a cohort of patients that we could study. Ultimately, we, um, we, we recruited six patients from my clinic. Um, all of them we essentially diagnosed um, with a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test along with all the other appropriate workup to sh be sure this is the real problem they had. And this is just to show you what, what this again looks like. With glucose, their blood sugars go way up to around 200 at 30 minutes and then drop precipitously around two hours to this hypoglycemic event. And their insulin similarly spikes early and then comes right back to almost zero once they get to that hypoglycemic uh, range. <clears throat> so we designed a study to test our question. Um, so I'm kind of talking through this in the steps that we went through. So uh, the second step was, the first step was, I guess, to identify the question and the problem. The second step was to design the study and get IRB approval. Um, what we decided was we wanted to put a G-tube into that excluded stomach, which is the picture there with the green arrow. We allowed that to heal for four weeks, and then we brought the patients into the clinical research unit here uh, in the hospital to do a mixed meal test. So that's basically drinking a, a bottle of Insure. Um, and then measuring essentially what happens to their glucose, insulin, GLP-1, a whole bunch of other gut peptides and hormones that we were interested in. Um, so the first test they did is they came in and they drank the Ensure orally, which is like the picture of that red arrow coming straight in through their gastric bypass anatomy. The second visit, would, which was usually the very next day, they came back in and we did the feeding through their, their gastric tube, which was going through their excluded stomach. And then um, if the patients experienced improved symptoms with gastric feeding, which they were also allowed to do at home to feed themselves through the G-tube, um, and if they had kind of positive um, postprandial findings on this two-day study, then we talked to them about the possibility of doing a gastric bypass reversal to try to see if that would help protect them from these symptoms. And again, we had no evidence that this would work. <laughs> this was our evidence at the moment that we had done this um, kind of trial in the patients of uh, feeding them through their G-tube as a way to mimic what we thought would happen if we reversed their gastric bypass. But we talked to our patients about the fact that we didn't really know if this was gonna work, but it was the only thing we could come up with to try to treat this severe problem, and they all consented to proceed with a reversal. Um, so the reversal was then done by, again, Guillermo Campos, and the patients were brought back four months later um, and we repeated the mixed meal test now through their kind of restored anatomy. And so what we found, um, so then we had to basically go out, recruit these patients, and execute the study. We found that, um, luckily, as we had hoped, um, that this alternate feeding route did, in fact, make a big difference. And um, it really normalized postprandial glucose and insulin responses. So what we're looking at here, the red, sorry, it came across a little garbly, but... The red here is the patients being fed through that gastric bypass anatomy orally when they're having those hypoglycemic events. Again, their glucose goes way up, drops down low at about 90 to 120 minutes. Their insulin similarly goes way up and then right back down. The um, G-tube is the green there, so that's feeding the same patient one day later. Nothing else has changed except we're giving the food through the stomach instead of through the um, right into the jejunum. And you can see it completely normalizes their postprandial glucose and their postprandial insulin. And then four months after the reversal, it looks very similar to that G-tube um, picture in that they have restored um, postprandial glucose and insulin secretion. No hypoglycemia. If you look at that 120-minute time point, you can see their blood sugars are very normal at that time. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, we also studied a lot of these gut hormones, trying to figure out what was causing it. For the interest of time, I'm only going to focus on the one, uh, which is GLP-1. 
And again, as we predicted, when you feed someone with gastric bypass, this GLP-1 goes way up. But again, if you feed them just through that different route, you lose that whole over-secretion of GLP-1, suggesting that it's not something inherent about the gut necessarily that's changed. It's just the way the food's coming in um, to that gut mucosa. So our final conclusions from this study were that this Again, this rapid rise and fall of glucose, insulin, and GLP-1 was ameliorated by feeding them through a different route, the G-tube or the, after the reversal. And what that told us is that the pathophysiology of this really was all about how the food is getting into the body, not so much about the pancreas itself. We don't think that there's any inherent changes in pancreatic beta cell anatomy or beta cell function um, because, again, the same patient responds completely differently if you just feed them through a different route. <clears throat> So back to the bedside. Sorry, we're running short on time. I'm going to go fast. <laughs> um, my patient, my original patient had the reversal surgery, continued to do very well, has had no significant recurrent hypoglycemia over more than four years of follow-up now. Um, the other five cases also had good clinical outcomes, um, over 12 months of follow-up for most of these patients, and no severe hypoglycemic events in any of these patients over time. Um, and... The step four for all of you who we want to inspire, not only do you want to go out and do this work, but then eventually you want to publish <laughs> because you want to get the work out there to the community to help people understand what you've done and how it informs clinical care. And then the last minute here, I'm just going to talk about um, GLP-1 directly. So I told you that GLP-1 was one of the big hormones that changed with this altered route of feeding and came way down in the patients when they had improved postprandial glucose. A couple other studies, which I won't go through in detail, um, show that if you directly target GLP-1 signaling by blocking its receptor, you can, again, these are in single patient, um, or single uh, trials of a mixed meal test. If you give the patient that GLP-1 receptor antagonist while they're getting their mixed meal, they also have improvement in their postprandial hypoglycemia and insulin secretion. So it suggested that if you can directly block that GLP-1 signal, it might be helpful. So the next thing I did is um, got kind of connected with some other people across the country who are interested in this problem, including a group through industry, and we um, kind of collectively worked together to do a clinical trial on a GLP-1 receptor antagonist. Um, so this is a phase two multicenter placebo-controlled study. The idea is you give placebo for the first two weeks, the patients then get one of two doses of the GLP-1 receptor antagonist for two weeks, and then, again, the other dose for the next two weeks. Throughout the study, the patients have a continuous glucose monitor on. They're doing home glucose monitoring. And then we bring them in at each of, after each two-week period to do a mixed meal test and see if they have improved outcomes in terms of hypoglycemia, postprandial insulin. So this study is not published yet. We're still working on the final results, but this part has been released publicly, so I'm able to tell you that the initial outcomes are very positive. We um, total recruited 18 subjects across multiple sites, two of them from here, um, and what we found was, in, again, improved postprandial glucose, so in other words, they didn't get as low after we gave them the mixed meal test um, with either dose. They went from either 47 as a low up to the, the mid-50s or the high 50s. They had less postprandial insulin secretion, and then on the home monitoring, fewer episodes of hypoglycemia, um, and it was well tolerated. So now this company, Iger Biopharmaceuticals, which is a company that's working specifically in the rare disease space, is looking for FDA guidance to um, try to get a, approval for this drug. Okay, so I'm going to kind of skip over this because I already said all this and we're almost out of time. But in summary, I just wanted to say um, the main message I wanted to give today is how can you move from clinic to the bench and then back to clinic? So the number one thing is be curious. <laughs> Think about the clinical challenges you're seeing. Read the literature and form questions and form hypotheses. Look for interested collaborators who um, want to work with you and interested trainees who want to work with you. None of this would have been possible without some of the endocrine fellows who worked with me on this project. Think about how to test your idea and eventually get all the necessary approvals. Use the amazing resources you have here, which is the CRU, which allows you to do these investigator-initiated studies essentially for free, which is amazing. Publish your studies, um, network with others, and then try to move it again to clinical trials. <clears throat> 
quickly acknowledging Guillerme Campos again. Um, Siri and, uh, and Rowan were both clinical uh, endocrine fellows and or instructors who worked on these projects. And then we have had a lot of support again from uh, the department, from ICTER for the CRU, and the Iger team is there as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So we're not going to have time for questions. People, please come up to the front and ask your questions. I know there's going to be several in the audience. <laughs>